I'm here in Leadville, Colorado to find out, can a novice mountain bike marathon racer take part in one of the world's toughest mountain bike marathon races, the Leadville 100? To make the race even more interesting, I'm going up against the experience of two-time Leadville veteran Walter Summers, who knows all the ups, downs, twists and turns of the course. Walter is also a Garmin test rider, so how am I supposed to measure up against Walter's experience? Well, I've teamed up with Garmin and they have kitted me out with their new Edge 830 unit, which is going to help coach me through the Epic. I can use the Climb Pro feature to educate me on the gradients and climbs ahead. I can even set food and hydration notifications to ensure that I stay on top of my fueling too. All I have to do is follow the course and pedal and let the Garmin worry about the finer details. That's the plan anyway. But why me? Well, for years I grew up riding and racing on the road, hearing about all of these great mountain bike events that I wanted to take part in, but because I had a busy training and racing schedule to stick to, it meant I could only read about them in magazines and on the internet. Well, one of the big events that sticks out in my mind is the Leadville 100, a 105 mile mountain bike marathon event across Colorado. Now in its 26th year, I finally get my chance to have my first go at a mountain bike marathon event. And I'm not gonna lie, when Blake and Neil asked if I was interested, I could not have said yes fast enough. I mean, everybody's heard about the Leadville Trail 100. It's, you know, the world's most iconic mountain bike race. Leadville is grit, guts, and determination. You can't help but lift your head up and look around because it's, it really is stunning terrain that you get to ride your bike through. There's very little that's not either up or down. I entered Leadville in the first place because I was curious. I wanted to know what all the hype was about, why all these people were coming to this race in you know this teeny weeny mountain town um, in the middle of Colorado. Uh, registration limit's about 1,800. A couple of hundred or so will get cold feet and <laughs> chicken out before the starting line. Tank's empty, you gotta dig deep. You, you gotta do exactly what the Leadville miners did 150 years ago, dig deep. Garmin didn't want to let me walk away with the bragging rights without them putting up a decent fight. But unlike me, Walter didn't come alone. He came armed with his riding buddies from Garmin HQ in Kansas City, Jordan and Andrew. The first few miles are actually on tarmac and it's onto the first section of dirt where the route starts to get narrow and starts to climb. The course really started to get hard at the bottom of Columbine. Up to then, it had been tough, but not an hour and 25 minutes, at an average gradient of 8%. The return leg of the event is surprisingly much harder than the way out. Some say the race doesn't start until the top of the mountain. The toughest part of the entire event is power lines on the return. Pitches of up to nearly 40% on the lower slopes, a total of just over five kilometers uphill at 7% average gradient. From here to the finish, you can really find your groove and push hard to make up a little bit of time. The route doesn't ease off until you climb the final grades into Leadville and cross the line. A total of 105 miles, 4,000 meters of climbing, and all run off at over 2,800 meters of elevation. Now I could stand here and tell you all about the Leadville 100, but I've never ridden it before. So we thought it was a better idea to chat to the founder and one of the most famous names from the race's history. There's very little that's not either up or down. It's the headwaters of the Arkansas River, so we're right between where two mountain ranges come together. Swatch Range is to the west, Mosquito Range to the, to the east, and Leadville just sits right up in that high valley. There are, there are a lot of things that are special about Leadville. I mean, one, the elevation puts you in above tree line in such amazing terrain, breathtaking. The other thing is it really is a huge gathering of the cycling tribe. You know, I'd never done a mountain bike race with thousands of people all in the same course, all just like wanting to be outside and ride their hearts out. And so for me, the first year, it really felt like, kind of like the Tour de France of of mountain biking. It was crazy, like screaming fans. And like, you never see that in a mountain bike race. You're usually alone. And it's just this small town vibe of hospitality and the locals welcoming you. And, you know, everybody just really appreciating the mountains and, and the beauty of this place. But the people are really special too. I was an underground shift boss at the Climax Mine. Great job. I look, God, I love that job. Went to work one, one swing shift, got all the gear on ready to go underground and a 
the mine boss called and said, come on up, we're gonna have a meeting. He went up to the mine office and, and he said, boys, we're closing the mine. Go back, tell your, tell your crews to go home, their unions will be in contact with them tomorrow and, and we'll be in contact with you, but it's over. Overnight, we became the highest unemployment in the nation. It's yeah. our family. The athletes that come here are part of our family. We, when we started out, it was, and this was from day one, uh, because our community was hurting so bad. It was all about what we could give, not what we could get. And, and we've maintained that all these years, and so we still do that. And we, uh, because it's grown so much, that gives us the opportunity to give more. One of the standout features of the Leadville 100 is the altitude. It starts at 2,800 metres and goes up to 3,800. Where we live in the west of England, it's not anything like that. We're basically at sea level. So we're going to go out for a couple of hours gently on the bikes to get used to the altitude a little bit. Ideally, you would have done this three weeks ago, but you know, what can you do? We had a real blast up on the mountainside of Breckenridge, a few final tweaks to the bike and a couple of tough efforts to get ready for the race tomorrow. Right, we're driving to the start at the moment. It's about 25 minutes away from where we stayed. There's a little bit more traffic today than there has been, but we've got the world's biggest vehicle, a big Suburban, so we can just push people out of the way. So I don't think we're gonna have any issues getting into town. Right, this is Leadville, start, start line in Leadville. Not the start line, 100 meters away from the start line. I can fill up my pockets with all my food. Make sure I've got everything else I need. Try and find somewhere to have a little wee, alleyway type of thing. And just make sure I get everything. And try to get to the start line on time. It's very important. This will be the most people I've ever lined up in one go with. Like normally in a bike race, you get 200 guys, and there's what 2,000 people here today. So 10 times as big. Except it's not just 10 times as big. It's hundreds of times as big like it's the biggest it's the biggest most well-known epic mountain bike cross-country race there is uh no sign of uh chris we think he uh he chickened out yeah um, that'd be a no-show he might be he could have been too scared it's entirely possible yeah we uh we think uh, mr opie's uh chickening out we're all looking for him but we don't see him all right this is it again we are actually gonna go all right record some carnage Ram! have fun see ya. <laughs> Off the start, it, you know, it's, it's kind of nerve-wracking, you know, it's 1,700 plus riders descending and trying to fight for position. We talked about that early on and we pretty much concluded that all of the descents should be played pretty safely. Um, and that goes for the beginning too, you know, there's no worse place to crash than the beginning of a, of a bike race, especially when you're bobbing downhill with, you know, 500 riders behind you. That so. went quite well. Overtaking 700 people, 800 people. I mean, we'll have to count it on the GoPro footage, quite pleased with that. Probably before we got to the first gravel sector as well, most of them, that was just, I was in my element because it was like being a road rider, but on a mountain bike, big bars to fit through these tiny gaps. Quite enjoyed that. It's a little, a little challenge. The three of us being out there was really, really nice. Um, that was kind of a really fun, uh, you know, like we mentioned before, Jordan's a, he's a pretty fast roadie and um, whenever we'd hit like a big hard flat road section, you know, we, we were like, everyone forgot to bring their Jordan out with them, you know, because he'd just get on the front and rip it for us. So for the first two hours, I chased pretty hard to find um, Walter, Andrew and Jordan. And I just got to the point where I was like, I feel like I should have caught them now. And again, this is my ego from bygone years, but I just felt like I'd ridden really quite hard for those two hours and I needed to ease off a little bit. Like I'd, I'd kind of start to notice that I was finding it harder than I was expecting. So from there on in, it got really hard. The power lines descent was probably, apart from the guy that switched me and tried to come across in front of me and then got upset with me, it was the best descent of the day. Just purely because it was 80, what, 82.8 kilometers an hour I did down there. <clears throat> Bearing in mind, you're on like marbly gravel. It's, it's average 12%, but the pitches are like 27% or more. 
and if you squeeze the brakes you're just going to lock up your tyres it was and there's all these little kickers as well so you, you actually get a bit of air that was that was the highlight of the day So actually something that really got me through the day was the little feature that, we, that I used on the Garmin and that was telling me how far I was to the next climb, how long the next climb was, what the gradient was. The only thing it didn't tell me was what the, great, what the surface was made of. So I think everyone before the event had kind of made it sound like it was quite gentle, and that, you know, just gravel. It was not gravel. It was like rocky and rooty and it was, it was rugged. It didn't get, it didn't get terribly dark. Um, I think again, riding with my buddies was a big part of that. Um, honestly, the, probably the darkest part of it is like when I was sitting behind their wheels and I'm like, I'm like painting it right now to just sit behind Andrew, sit behind Jordan. So I was like, these guys are so strong. So that was probably the, honestly, the hardest part. And then, you know, I'd get my second win and I was like, all right, you know, it's time for me to do some work. But um, no, it never went, never went super, super dark. Honestly, it was just like, you know, we'd be riding uphill and then you'd turn and it was just like a wall and you're just like, ah. Oh. So it was very temporary darkness, you know, and then you'd get up and over it and you'd, you know, get back on your bike and keep going. So it was kind of like, I'd say it was a little, uh, it was a little gray out, you know, for most of the day. The worst part of my day, it was Columbia Mountain. That was where I really started to struggle with the altitude. Somewhere between 3,000, 3,200, I realized that that was my limit and everything higher than that, I was, I was in a dark place. Didn't think I'd get off and walk to be honest. Feels good though. Right now, anything but pedaling feels good. I'm getting passed by a lot of guys again. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say I'm suffering more than ever. It's just, I've underestimated it massively. So I'm nowhere near my goal of seven hours. It turns out that was probably quite stupid anyway. I am near eight hours. I was in a really dark place until some friendly friendly competitor came over and said look it's only the altitude that's making you suffer as soon as you go back down you'll feel better like your thoughts run wild you feel dizzy like you can barely see anything glasses on glasses off doesn't matter there's no oxygen in your brain a lot of guys were cheering everyone on quite a few people do recognize the jersey which you know considering you guys don't wear lycra on the channel very often it was quite cool to hear that and um <clears throat> I had the worst arm pump of my life. So I was behind someone that wasn't that fast on Columbine on the descent, which means you're riding the brakes the entire time. Obviously 34 PSI and the tires and the sho shocks are pumped up pretty hard. My hands were claws. And eventually I said, can I just go by? And as soon as you let off the brakes, it all disappears then because you, you're not trying to squeeze and slow yourself down. We had to, we, we bit off a little bit um, at Pipeline. Our SAG crew was not there or we couldn't find him. So we all went into that last three hours with one water bottle and, you know, more sugar. Uh, we all had some savory stuff packed away. We were pretty excited about it and not having that um, was a, kind of a bummer. Um, so trying to get around the fact that we only had one water bottle for that last long section was, uh, kind of a, a hiccup and then we got over it. I think Powerline is the hardest climb. I think Powerline is the hardest climb on earth, actually. And I remember as we were approaching Powerline thinking, I'm feeling pretty tired right now. Until you see it, you don't realize just how steep it is and how unrelenting it is. So we all took a jab at it and you know, we watched Jordan right away from us. I think I made it up about seven tenths of the climb and I, I looked back to see if Andrew was behind me, which he was, but it was enough for me to slide out my front wheel and then, you know, we had to hike the last bit of it, but it was so hard. <laughs> Suffering like I've never suffered. I cannot get into life. Just how hard it is.
was ecstatic that I made the nine hour cutoff. Uh, it was so exhilarating to come in and know I made it by just that much. And the whole crowd is there, everyone's cheering for you. They said my name over the loudspeaker, Jordan Miller from Garmin. Uh, it was surreal. Those final 10 Ks were just all out. That was me in my zone. That was like riding a road race, you're in a break or riding a time trial. I got arrow, I went fast and I crushed it. And I came in with just like that much to spare too. It was a special moment. I did have a little sprint at the end because when you ride to the finish with another rider, you can just, you, for a start, you hear gear changes, but then also you just, the tempo rises. Everyone wants to finish looking strong, right? Because that's where the people are watching. And you could just tell what was gonna happen. Like it's one of those things, you get dropped in a bike race and everyone kind of just pedals a little bit harder to get over the finish to make it look to their team managers that they've not just sat up and cruised in. Stupid, really, like it, it means nothing. But this did mean something because it was a proper sprint. That was quite good fun. Hardest bike race, hardest bike ride, hardest thing I've ever done on a bike. Coming back next year, support team. I'd like to recover first before I make a bold statement. I think it'd be really cool to come back and, uh, you know, see if you could put everything you've learned this week into practice. That'd be cool. And the result, and who was actually fastest, the Leadville novice or the veteran? Walter finished the race in nine hours, seven minutes and one second. And I, I'm pleased to say, did it in eight hours, 14 minutes and 12 seconds, about 53 minutes faster. But the most important thing is that I was sub nine hours, which means I got one of these big shiny finisher belts. So it's the morning after Leadville, after a night's sleep, and we're all feeling pretty battered to be honest. But we've made it back to the start time because the day after the event, they give out the belt buckles to all the finishers. If you finish under nine hours, you get a big one. And you can see Walter, Jordan, and Andrew, they've all got theirs. It's now my turn to go inside and find mine. We're in a massive queue. It's a bit like lining up yesterday morning to get the uh, belt buckles. Sweet, thank you very much. Cheers. Give me your toys. So, made it out of the hall where I got my finisher jacket with my old nickname, Speedy Opie, it's printed on there, and my finishing time. But more importantly, something that's going to look pretty cool in the dirt shed, hopefully, assuming they let me put it in there is my finishes buckle. Look at the size of that thing. So you only get the big one if you finish under nine hours. And I managed it. <laughs>